Hi, everybody. It looks like uh, people are still joining here. So I'm going to try to entertain you for a couple minutes while we let people join. And then we're going to pass it over to Alexis. So um, upcoming webinars. We have uh, next week, we have Asiya, who's going to do a deeper dive into our Lego um, software. We had her do a basic one last week. This one's going to be a deeper dive into it. Uh, we also have our very own Dr. Rio Vetter is going to give a talk on, on catalog probes. And um, that's going to be a great one for any questions that you have about our technology or probes. And uh, we also have Jamie Hetke, who's going to give a custom design webinar uh, coming up soon. We have some tentative plans with some special guests. Um, we're still working out some, some logistics on that. Uh, and we'll let you know if you um, want to be in, included in our email webinar uh, information. And then you could also get sales information. You could add your uh, email to the chat here and we'll get it off there. And it looks like we have a pretty good amount of attendees. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Alexis, and then I'm going to hand it over to her. Alexis is um, is working from us remotely. She doesn't live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, like the rest of us. She's from Boston, or should I say Boston, where they drive their cars and get their chowder. Um, and now you guys are all going to be disappointed because she doesn't actually have a Boston accent. Um, but uh, she is a trained neuroscience with a degree in brain and cognitive sci sci sciences and a minor in music from MIT. She received her PhD in neurophysiology from McGill. She's worked on a mouse model of Alzheimer's, behavioral testing of rat somatosensory system and electrophysiology in the primate vestibular system. Uh, Dr. Perez's work was at the forefront of multi-channel recordings in deep primate brain and this exposed her to Neuronexus several years ago. Now as an application scientist, Dr. Perez looks forward to drawing on her 10 plus years of neuroscience research experience to help meet the evolving needs of our customers. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Alexis. Hey, everyone. Can If you can see me, let us know in the chat really quick. Just say hi or hi, Alexis. I see a hi. Hi. Thanks. All right. So my goal today is to um, introduce myself as someone that may be in your shoes. So if you're a graduate student, maybe a senior graduate student, if you're a postdoc or research associate, um, or a, a PI that's getting is new to electrophysiology, sort of anything in that context. Um, or if you've worked with mice or rats or primates, am I getting everybody yet? Um, let's see. I kind of want to speak to my experience and yours and show you how Neuronexus fits into the work that we do. So um, let me get my slides going. The work that I'm presenting today is, can't start the presentation without sharing with you first. Um, the work I present today is for my research in the primate vestibular system, which Matt alluded to. Um, I should maybe add a disclaimer that I do work for Neuronexus. I've worked for Neuronexus for two and a half years. So I'm not entirely just presenting my science. I will um, insert some sales in here, of course. Um, so this title actually came from my, um, let me just, Matt, can we confirm the slides are showing and everything's good? Or should I follow the chat? Yeah, it looks good to me. Okay, um, thanks everybody. Okay, so this is actually the title of my dissertation, which was completed in March of 2017, an investigation of subcortical contributions to self motion perception. So. These are the, I'll just start from the beginning. These are the folks that were involved in my work at McGill. Kathy Cullen was my PhD supervisor. We were funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. It's like the NIH in the United States. These were all the people I overlapped with. 
So just in case I don't get to forget, um, thank them again um, at the end of this, I did wanna make sure they were there. Also, of course, this is the team of people behind every interaction you guys have with NeuroNexus. So these are all of us working from home the last few weeks. Um, I can just really quick, Tegun, Alexis, Nikki, Matt, Lawrence, Asiya, Emery, and Jeff. Um, and we're all here for you, happy to chat with you. And I will jump in. So this is what we call a science update. Um, NeuroNexus does like to feature publications by customers or ongoing work by customers. If you have something you would like to present, please do reach out to us and we'd be happy to maybe interview you on one of these webinars or certainly feature your publication if it is open access and we are allowed to do so. Um, we do feature publications on our LinkedIn page. We will, we're getting them back onto our website, et cetera. So the vestibular system, um, we like to think of it as a sixth sense and everybody knows their vision and their taste and their smell and their hearing and their touch. And those are senses that we know very well because we can turn them off. We know what it's like not to have them. You can close your eyes, you can cover your ears, you can plug your nose, you can taste something really off-putting and it affects your flavor of other things. You can go numb, you know what it feels like. The vestibular system is one of those senses, so to speak, that you don't know what it's doing for you until you lose it. Um, so anybody that's experienced vertigo or blurred vision might appreciate what the vestibular system does. Otherwise, the fact that you're upright and can see clearly, we kind of take for granted, right? So the sensors of the vestibular system are in your inner ear and those signals detected in your inner ear, mechanically detected in the inner ear, um, travel through the eighth cranial nerve to the vestibular nuclei in your brainstem. So we sometimes call it even primates the lizard brain because it's such a primitive part of your brain. Um, and then these signals help maintain your postural control, they stabilize your vision, and also help in navigation. So, uh, well, I was gonna say a few years ago, but it's been more than that now. Um, the Nobel Prize was awarded for um, characterizing place cells and grid cells and things um, that a lot of hippocampal researchers would know. Um, and that's sort of the navigation center of your brain. And the vestibular system feeds into that. So the vestibular system feeds to head direction cells, which actually tell your brain where you're facing in the world. Um, and you kind of helps you remember where you've been, where you're going and things like that. So another one of those things that you kind of innately sense, but don't realize that your brain is doing. So let me start with the labyrinth and how these signals are sensed. The vestibular sensors in the inner ear comprise three semicircular canals that sense angular velocity. Um, in three orthogonal planes, as well as two autolith organs, which sends linear acceleration, again, in three orthogonal directions. And the pathways that I studied were ascending. So none of the spinal control, postural control, but kind of in between both the ocular motor system, which played into the head direction cells that I was describing, as well as perception of your movement through the thalamus and then onto cortical regions. And I wanted to highlight this first synapse um, between the inner ear and your vestibular nuclei. When the, um, our lab's main um, question that we addressed was based on the following. So if you record, if you apply a, passively apply a head velocity to um, a participant, a subject, and record from the eighth nerve, the firing rate of those vestibular afferents, so going from the sensor into the brain, um, is directly proportional to that rotational head velocity, say. And if the participant or subject um, creates their own head movement voluntarily, the firing rates again reliably encode that movement. If you record from the vestibular nuclei, so just one synapse later, there's actually a complete, very stark difference. It's probably, it's about 70 or 80% attenuation of the signal in the vestibular nuclei during a voluntary movement. And Thank goodness this actually does happen. So say you wanted to, let me back up. Um, one of the features of the, when I kept harping on stable vision, um, the vestibular system is responsible for the vestibular ocular reflex. So I want everybody to try, nobody can see you, so you can all do this. Hold your finger out in front of you. Yeah, I can do it too, I have a Band-Aid on this one, so we'll do this one. Hold your finger out in front of you and focus on your fingernail. And now shake your head. Your fingernail's not blurry, you're staring at it still. So that's how quickly and reliably your vestibular information goes from your ear to the bottom of your brain, to your eye muscles, to keep your eye counteracting the movement of your head. And 
when you all of a sudden want, so that's what, even like if something unexpected, if somebody were to come over and knock me down right now or push the side of my head, you can't see me. Um, or maybe you can't um, push the side of my head and I'd still want to look at this webcam. Um, my vestibular system is going to help me stay focused on the webcam or my slides or whatever, even if I unexpectedly get jostled. Thank goodness when I voluntarily reorient, that reflex is suppressed, right? So if I want to go, whoa, there's a big bird out my window, my eyes aren't trying to like stay way back here on the webcam, they're letting me turn. Or say I want to do a backflip. I don't want my body saying, uh oh, you slipped, I need to keep you upright. It's going to let me go backward. So that was a, we like that this happens. Um, but then the big question is, how do you still perceive the movement that's going on if it's not signaled? If it's all of a sudden there's no signal at all when you're moving yourself, how do you keep track of what you're doing? So the big question is, how is this self-motion, the movement of yourself, encoded in these ascending vestibular pathways? So here's one of the pathways that I looked at. So from the vestibular afferents into the brainstem, there's also projection to the deep cerebellar nuclei to the ventral posterior lateral thalamus and into cortical regions. Um, the experiments that I did just to get everybody um, a better picture were on non-human primates, rhesus, rhesus macaque monkeys. They were sitting in a primate chair on a turntable that was also mounted on a linear sled. Um, they had the ability to move their head on their body. They could be head restrained or free to move. Um, we could also restrain their head but move their body underneath them and I'll explain this later. Um, but we used magnetic search coils to track eye movements, as well as always tracking the head movements based on, excuse me, <clears throat> based on um, a gyroscope on the head or mounted sensors on the head. And then we recorded, I recorded single channel and multi-channel um, extracellular activity. And the first step I was gonna, um, looking in the ocular motor system was in the nucleus propositus. So this was the first step. Um, Stop on the way to the ascend through the ascending vestibular pathway. Um, and this circuit in gray, what is the vestibular ocular reflex pathway that we actually look at? If you change the stochastic burst neuron to the vestibular nuclei, the inner ear would project to this nucleus to the abducens motor neuron. So that's the sixth cranial nucleus um, that directly connects to the lateral rectus muscle of your eye. Repositus is considered a neural integrator. So if this burst from a psychotic burst neuron, so something that would generate a movement of your eye creates a burst and that gives you eye velocity. The, there's a copy of that signal that goes through what is called this nucleus propositus, which is right next to the vestibular nuclei. That's why they're all related. Um, and it's thought to be an integrator. It makes that, it takes that velocity signal and turns it into a position signal and helps you hold your eye in a certain position. And so what we know from single unit recordings is that these neurons do indeed have that burst signal, but then maintain eye position. So if your eye position, upward is right, downward is left, changes, um, the firing rate of the neuron changes with it. And if you move your eye in a smooth way, you follow, say, in the dark, we have a laser that moves back and forth in a sinusoidal way, the firing rate of the neuron will do the same thing. Um, and then during vestibular ocular reflex, so the head is moving, the eyes are moving the other way, the opposite way to counteract it so that your eye position I, this is your eye and head position. Your eye position in the world is actually not changing. Your eye position in your head is changing. So your eye muscle does have to move, but your head is also moving. So think about that for a second. Um, and I will parse this out a bit later so you can see how we're isolating the movement of different things. Um, the main risk, the result that I, my first study showed was that when you make a big gaze shift, so that's when like I said, if I want to look out the window and say, hey, there's this giant bird that just flew by, I have to turn my head, you know, 90 degrees to my right. What happens is my eyes will jump first because my head is big and heavy. It's going to go later. Um, and so first we test, okay, let's isolate just the eye movement, make as big a saccade as I can. So that's the ballistic eye movement from a central fixation to something far to my right. When you see the firing rate of these neurons that encode eye velocity, it's going to jump. It's going to have this big increase in spikes. Um, your eyes move to the right, your eyes move to the right very quickly, and your head is not moving. So we can actually model the firing rate of the neurons very well as a function of some gain of eye velocity and some gain of firing rate, um, eye position, as well as a baseline firing rate. So that is something to um, mention and will come into play later when I talk about the number of neurons that I do get. But 
or did get. Um, the baseline firing rates of most of the neurons that I was looking at were around you know, 40, 50, 60 spikes per second. So a lot of you that may be more used to cortical neurons or other, um, brains, or other brain areas that have much lower firing rates, this is the world that I was in. So that did take that context um, as we start planning future recordings. Anyway, for this study, so we know this neuron behaves like an eye movement related neuron. When all of a sudden we add this giant head movement along with it, is this head movement now a vestibular signal going to impact how the neuron responds? And what this, the main story is that no, it doesn't. The firing rate still behaves as a eye movement related neuron only. Um, and these, okay, just to bring it back to, like I said, the types of recording, um, this experiment was single unit recordings with tungsten wire electrodes. And so you kind of aim for the nucleus propositus in an acute recording, maybe find a neuron, record it through all these different, you know, make the animal perform saccades of different sizes, different speeds, perform head movements of different sizes, different speeds, and then hopefully you still have the neuron. <laughs> um, and then you maybe move the, move the electrode or take it out and go somewhere else, try another penetration. And anyway, it was a, quite a long process. So what eventually would happen and what I encourage any of you still using tungsten wires to do is scale up your recordings, right? So Neuronexus makes linear electrodes. So the geometry of this thing compared to this thing is the same, right? So the diameter here, the horizontal width of this probe is 125 microns. Um, I'm pretty sure the diameter of my tungsten electrodes was three or 400, because I know we used a pretty big guide tube to get it in there. Um, and this probe is 15 microns thick. It's very, very small. It's just as stiff as this guy. So you're not moving, it, you're not missing your target. Anyway, so this has 16 channels. Then we have eight shanks with 16 channels. So when we refer to shanks on Neuronexus probe, it's these teeth on this comb, so to speak. And you can have one, or you could have eight. You can have even more. So depending on your brain area and how much space you have to cover, in the primate, the nucleus propositus is 1.2 millimeters long from front to back. So I would love to put, or would have loved to have this probe, well, maybe not in the primate, it would be very deep, but in the mouse, where my colleague is working on that now, um, you could sample from the entire front to back distance of the nucleus repositus in one penetration. So just think about how much easier that would be. Okay, so the next question is once we have simultaneous recordings, so now we're doing multi-channel recordings instead of just single channel recordings, does local population synchrony play a role in eye position encoding? So now that we've characterized these neurons are definitely eye movement related, what does the population activity do, have to do with the encoding of eye position, eye velocity and eye position? Um, and the reason we asked this question is that in other animals, it had been shown that there's a, a way to um, implicate, let's say, the population synchrony in eye position encoding. Um, and the reason that I asked this question is, let's say you want to hold, well, the point is if you want to keep your eye all the way over, if I want to keep facing you, but look out the window to my right and keep my eye there, the lateral rectus muscle of my, next to my eye is firing, 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 firing. And does it get tired? Does the muscle want to jitter? Because the neurons are, if our, the neurons are all synchronized, are you going to just get, you know, these pulsating signals to the muscle and your eye starts shaking? That doesn't happen. So maybe there's, a, there's no synchrony. Is that possible? Let's just see um, what the answers are. So I conducted simultaneous recordings of these burst tonic neurons. So the burst is the eye velocity, tonic is that sustained activity related to eye position. And let's say there's two neurons, they behave nicely. Um, when your eye is farther to the left, their firing rate is lower. When your eye is farther to the right, their firing rate is higher. So this guy has a eye position sensitivity of approximately 2.7 spikes per second per degree of eye position. This one's a little bit more sensitive. Two neurons at once. Then if we look at their tonic firing rate, so when there's sustained activity during some held eye position, so if the eyes are straight ahead, here's the cross correlation between their firing rates. So I, we pull out spike sort, pull out a binary spike train, and then run a cross correlation between them. And then we look at how many times we expect the neurons to fire at the same time. And here's what their cross correlation looks like. If the eyes are farther to the right, you see that both neurons firing rates go up based on that eye position sensitivity I showed you. And so 
you as you would expect, there's a overall higher level correlation because both there's more spikes, right? So both neurons increase their firing, they're going to be more correlated. And if the animal looks to the left, again, both firing, went, firing rates went down. So their correlations also predictably went down. And I checked other positions in between, made a pretty rainbow. <laughs> um, what I wanted to highlight, though, is if you look at this sort of zero lag between the firing rates, the, fire, the spike trains, excuse me, between the spike trains, um, there's no sort of peak in this farthest to the right eye position. And there's this really big peak at zero in this farthest to the left eye position. And what we're calling these peaks that come out, so this band is what you'd expect. It's some expected level of synchrony based on the firing rate. And when the eyes are farther to the left, so the firing rates of the neurons are lower, the neurons actually seem more prone to firing together. And when the eyes are farther to the right and the firing rates of both neurons are high, the neurons are actually not firing together any more than you would expect them to. So something seems to be synchronizing the neurons when their firing rates are low. And I can plot the size of this peak as a function of eye position. And there's a significant um, trend. So it meaning that the magnitude of this excess synchrony, the unexpected level of firing together, is dependent on eye position. And then when you use a linear neuron, a linear neuron, a linear probe, um, this is what mine looked like, but we can also um, use the silicon shank of the neuron axis probe. Um, and I actually had to figure this out for myself, um, you know, imagining that spacing is 50 microns between each site. So I sort of grouped things because I didn't know exactly how far apart my neurons were. If you look at the um, trend in excess synchrony as a function of how far apart the two neurons were, the farther apart they were, the less the fewer coincidence spikes you'd expect to get um, or you'd end up seeing. And so that tells us this excess synchrony again is dependent on the relative distance between the neurons. It's a seemingly predictable thing. Um, but it's not a trivial thing to find out. Um, so the question, does local population synchrony play a role in eye position encoding? Yes, it does. And this is the prediction that I came up with, that there's common input coming from the, so there's all these, the circuit that I showed you before is much more complicated, right? Always. Um, the opposite nucleus propositus hypoglossy, that's what the NPH stands for, um, projects to the place where I'm recording from. And those projections, so, as we said, all the neurons on the same side have that same, let's call it the positive eye position sensitivity. So relative to those, the guys on the other side have a negative eye position sensitivity. So when the neurons I'm recording from have their firing rates decreased, when the eyes are to the left and the excess synchrony is high, right? We're all on the same page. The excess synchrony is higher than we want, higher than we expect. Um, when the eye position is to the left, the firing rate of these guys that I'm recording from is low the opposite side then would have their firing rate higher and they project over and they project and sort of splay out. They're not projecting just one neuron to one neuron, they're projecting and arborizing. So the common input from this guy to these guys could be synchronizing them. Um, and like I said, so this is when you're fixating to the left, when you're fixating to the right, these neurons are more active talking to each other. This input is less active, so they're not as synchronized. Um, and so I sort of drew this schematic and color coded it based on what I'd expect with firing rate levels and um, excess synchrony levels. And it reminded me of, or actually the work I'm doing now reminded me of this, where in our Allego software, so the NeuronXus Allego software allows you to say I had my dream come true and I could use a multi shank probe to record from propositus from the front, the anterior to the posterior axis, which is actually organized. Um, in a, sorry, it's got a gradient from eye position sensitivity, or from eye velocity sensitivity in the back to eye position sensitivity in the front. So that has been shown for many, many years. Um, so I knew that if I wanted, if I had a multi shank probe, I would orient it, say, from anterior to posterior and record groups of neurons in, um, in that organization. Um, those of you that study the auditory system 
a lot of studies have been done with neuronexus single shank probes aligned along the tautotopic or I guess perpendicular to the tautotopic axis in auditory cortex and in superior colliculus or inferior colliculus, et cetera. Um, those of you that record somatosensory system, um, again, you could go along the somatotopic axis somehow, or in the visual system, you could orient a probe along or against the retinotopic axis, et cetera. So that's the advantage, right, of these multi-shank probes. And then in our LEGO software, you can see your exact probe and the activity on the shanks. Um, and so here, like we have this, you know, highly correlated neuron, and then the relationship between this guy and the ones farther away from it sort of changes color um, closer to blue, sort of like what my neurons did. So it would have made my life a lot easier just to have this <laughs> right in front of me at the time. Okay. Let's move on to exciting vestibular system stuff again. Um, so I went through the nucleus propositus, which was my sort of anterior ascending vestibular pathway. I have this posterior ascending vestibular pathway that goes through the ventral posterior lateral thalamus. Um, and we know, okay, there's direct inputs from the vestibular nuclei, which I told you that's your lizard brain that responds to re um, reliably encodes. Your head motion when it's passively applied does not reliably encode um, head motion when it's voluntarily generated. And this area of the thalamus projects directly to cortex. So the question, of course, is does this area, these inputs to cortex, differentiate the active and passive self-motion? Again, here's a better picture of the ventral posterior lateral thalamus between LP and VP. If you're used to know, if you know about the lateral geniculate, so any um, visual people, it's very close. Um, medial geniculate is a little bit more posterior, but it's also very close. Um, in a human brain, <laughs> that's where you would find it. Um, and these neurons, so we're not talking just vestibular neurons anymore. We're not talking just eye movement neurons anymore. It's a little bit more complicated as we move into the circuit. So we have vestibular only neurons still, which are helpful. Um, and then we also have neurons sensitive to neck proprioception. So now we're getting some of this postural signal in there. And this is how we determine, this is how we characterize the neuron. So to stimulate the neuron with just vestibular signals, the a monkey's head is fixed to the primate chair. There's a, you know, a head post and everything's sort of held in place and we rotate the entire chair on a turntable. So now we get, there's no head movement on the body because the monkeys are used to it and they stay still. Um, their head is moving in space, their whole body's moving in space and the neuron does respond to this stimulus. To determine their sensitivity to these neck movement, um, neck muscles, you fix the monkey's head in space. So we actually have another lock that holds just the head and the head post and then allows the turntable to turn underneath. So the head's not moving, no vestibular input, but the body is moving in space. And this particular neuron does not barely respond. Then you can have both of these signals activated at the same time by passively rotating. So the same lock that holds the head still while the body rotates in this central condition. In this last condition, you can use, so the turntable now stops and you use that other input to rotate only the head. And again, the monkeys do not fight this. They're very used to it. They're totally fine. Um, the head now moves on the body. The head is moving in space, but the body itself is not moving and the neuron responds. So what is this neuron doing? Look, the firing rates match head and space velocity. So you highlight this is the row that corresponds to the firing rates. These guys are vestibular neurons. Then you get vestibular and proprioceptive um, sensitivity. I'll highlight just really quick. When the body is moving under the head, that's when the neuron's responding the most. So it's kind of combining vestibular and neck inputs and getting the biggest firing rate. So we're saying this neuron's sensitive to both vestibular and neck inputs. Long story short, let's cut to the punchline. When I ask the monkey to make giant voluntary head movements. So here it goes, big, big gaze shift to the right big gaze shift to the left. Meanwhile, the turntable is just passively doing a sine wave. So their head and space velocity is now this big black line. The passive part is blue. The active part that I pulled out is red. So their head on body is not doing anything. He's just swiveling back and forth and boom, look to the right. Swiveling back and forth, boom, look to the left. The firing rate, if, it were if the neuron were sensitive to head and space, or say when something is passive, maybe pay attention to the whole, not attention, I shouldn't use that word, but maybe encode the entire stimulus, you would get, you'd expect a firing rate that looks like this dotted line. And that is not what we get. We get a very reliable encoding of just that passive part. 
Um, and here's a summary just along the um, vestibular circuitry. We have neurons sensitive only to vestibular inputs, which are the solid colors, the white and the black, black and white. And then the neurons that are sensitive to vestibular and neck inputs, and those are striped. And the mostly black bars are the passive responses. And the mostly white bars are the active responses, both for nice and slow, sort of what happened over there, oh, cool movements, versus oh my goodness, what's out my, the corner of my eye movements. In both cases, there's a big reduction in sensitivity of the neuron to the actively generated movements. And this is shown now as we go up the ascending vestibular pathway, like I showed you at the beginning, the afferent, so the eighth nerve that projects from your ear to your brainstem, encodes these guys um, reliably, both of them the same way. And the vestibular nuclei, so this now, sorry, so this now black and white is not active passive, black and white are rotation and translation. So we have the monkeys do the same thing. We're rotating like a swivel chair. We also have them back and forth on linear sled in various axes. Um, and the sensitivity drops for both. So here's like a 60%, 60, 70% drop. Similar 60, 70% drop in the deep cerebellar nuclei. This is the rostral vestigial. And again, even more of a drop in the ventral posterior lateral thalamus. Um, so yeah, our active and passive self motion differentiated in these vestibular inputs that go to the cortex for perception. Yes, they are. And the next question, of course, is does population activity change? So in the first positives, we showed when firing rate went down, excess synchrony is what we were calling it then, went up. Um, so actually what we, what you know, the, the computational folks would actually call this are noise correlations. So I wanted to define this just so that we could, for the sake of discussion, um, say these neurons are responding to passive vestibular stimulation. Their response, their firing rate might be this messy little thing, but in general, it's a sine wave. And a second neuron, again, it's in general, it's a sine wave. So when I say these estimates, like even just this last example, the estimate is something, some gain, some function of this sine wave, right? Even if it's a little bit messy. So we can predict that sine wave part of it. That's the average response. And then, so that's what we would call a signal correlation. So that's the kind of, that's the expected level of correlation between these neurons. And when you remove that part, you have the residual, these little, the noise around that um, average response. And the correlation between those is the noise correlation. So I ran lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of recordings with little eight channel probes, uh, wire probes. Um, got, you know, a couple of neurons at a time maybe. So that's what I wanted to speak to. And I, I didn't make a slide for this. So bear with me while I talk. You can look at these pretty soothing colors of these noise correlations for a minute. Um, what I wish I had, and now that I know I can have it, I would, if I could go back and do these recordings again. One, yes, thank goodness we went to multi-channel recordings so we can get neurons recorded simultaneously because it's just not the same to record neuron after neuron after neuron, same sine waves, same maybe, same gaze shifts, but if they're not recorded simultaneously, you don't know that the brain state was the same. You don't know if the monkey was awake or asleep or hungry or thirsty or angry or whatever. So when you record them all at the same time, you get a lot more data. Um, then I had, like I said, these were wire bundles and we are going quite deep into the macaque brain through the cerebellar tentorium. So there's a thicker um, barrier of tissue between the, you know, the upper brain and the cerebellum. And we actually had to go through the cerebellum to get to the brainstem. So you're puncture, not puncturing, but penetrating thicker um, areas of tissue, there's ventricles, there's various, you know, changes in, I'm losing words. Um, there's changes in, you know, the consistency. <laughs> I think I'm thinking of cooking words. Anyway, there's changes in the material that the probe is going through on its way down. And there's no real way, or at the time, there was no real way of knowing if it was bending, if it was deflecting, if it was getting to the target. So thank goodness we have these neurons that are pretty easily characterized based on sensitivity to eye movements or vestibular inputs or neck inputs, et cetera. Um, but you had to find them. So if I finally find a spot and I get one neuron, now I have to go find another spot and get more neurons. So the, I recommend silicon probes, which are reproducible, reliable, reusable, and stiffer 
so that you get where you're going. Um, and then the fact that they're multi-channel, um, I have data from vector array users that tell me the yield. So like I said, my yield is low because my firing rates are so high that it's hard to tell neurons apart from multi-unit activity. You kind of can't do it with our neurons. But in other brain areas, you probably could. And so what, I mean, think about it for a second. If you isolate two neurons, you have one pair to run noise correlations with. If you isolate three neurons, you have three pairs. If you isolate four neurons, you now have six pairs when you kind of cross everybody with each other. When you isolate five neurons, you now have 10 pairs, et cetera. So it scales up very quickly. Um, and then you get lots of answers. So these lovely folks that I had worked with before are still doing this. And actually the scene has changed a little bit. So let me update this. So Kathy Collin is still the PI. She's now at Johns Hopkins. The work in McGill is now funded by the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. Omid and Vanessa are at Johns Hopkins. Watch for their abstracts coming for SFN because they are doing this now. So here are the directions that this work is going in. So can checking active versus passive encoding in the rodent repositories. So my first study, Vanessa is now doing this in rodents. And so the Neuronexus probe that I recommend for her, we have a smaller probe than what was used in the primate, obviously, which would look like this. So this is a chronic Neuronexus probe in one little, this is the ISTCM. This is how you would manipulate the probe and insert it. Even for an acute recording, you can use our quote unquote chronic probes. Um, but I would not recommend this for an actively behaving animal. Um, you can't have the probe fixed to the world and the animal moving its head. That sounds very scary. So you would use one of our hybrid packages. So the probe can be inserted, maybe control the connector or tack the connector down to the skull or even a backpack or something like that so that there's no rigid connection between the probe and the rest of the world. Um, it can be floating and the animal can turn its head and even if the connector kind of moves a little bit, it's not yanking on the probe. Or the best solution actually is to use a microdrive that can be implanted on the animal. So it's like an acute recording if you want it to be. Um, you can record while you're inserting the probe, know that you're in the right place, cement the probe in place, and then move it up and down on subsequent days using this D drive, is the Neuronexus D drive. And this is on a mouse skull. So it's definitely a doable thing in mice. Another project that's going on is the same sort of multi-unit recordings that I wanted to do in the vestibular nuclei and the deep cerebellum. Um, the folks at McGill, still at McGill are doing in the thalamus now. So the same study that I showed you at the end where we isolated neurons that were vestibular sensitive or neck sensitive and determined that they were, they differentiated the active and the passive movements. Um, now though, those were single unit studies. Now they're doing multi-unit studies with the Neuronexus vector array. And the group at McGill is also using the first, uh, among the first Neuronexus opto vectors. So this is the vector array, which is between 60, 70 millimeters and up to 100, 110. We even made a 125 millimeter long probe and theirs have optical fiber and optical fiber in them. Um, so that'll also help with, in the ocular motor system at least, there's um, homogeneous populations, like you know all those eye sensitive, eye velocity and eye position sensitive neurons. Um, when I was in the lab, they were still trying to develop the virus to mark or tag those, that specific neuronal population um, with a rhodopsin so that they could potentially drive eye movements, which would have been super, super cool. Um, anyway, I wanted to end with, if you need help, so I kind of really quickly ran through choosing a few different probes for these applications. If you need help choosing a probe, just a shameless plug, I've been writing articles explaining these, you know, hodgepodge alphabet soup of the Neuronexus model number. So these model numbers are very standardized. They give you a lot of information. Um, so I'm breaking them down on LinkedIn. Um, and actually Matt has a link to our company LinkedIn page. Um, I may even have it quickly too. And I can put it into the chat box if I can find the button. Anyway, I'll just keep talking um, and somebody else can do that. <laughs> but um, a couple of weeks ago, we explained, I explained the leading letter of the Neuronexus model number. So usually this A, but there's an M, there's a E, anyway. Um, and then earlier this week, the face of the Neuronexus probe, so the next two numbers. And then today, I'll be publishing the electrode site layout. So what does poly2 mean? What does edge mean? When would you want to use one or the other? 
and then next Monday, the geometry of the Nernst's probe, so these dimensions that come after, et cetera. Um, so please do follow us. We are trying to get more and more scientific content, including these webinars, um, to your computer screens. And uh, it looks like that's going to be it. So thank you so much. And thank you, Alexis. And uh, thanks, we'll everybody.